Let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today we are very honored to have uh, Professor Stephen um, Acobado from UCLA uh, to give us a very uh, interesting talk about uh, indigenous archaeology on the title Indigenous Archaeology, Decolonizing uh, in Field Goal History. And uh, this is uh, your, date, your latest book, right, Professor Acobado, right? Yeah. So uh, Professor Acobado is an anthropological archaeologist, um, and uh, he, uh, uh, his research interest uh, focuses on human environmental interaction and um, indigenous community, particularly indigenous community, uh, indigenous responses to the colonialization. And uh, he has a number of projects in different places, uh, in Philippines and in Taiwan. And uh, 2015, in 2015, um, uh, Professor Acobado published a book, uh, which is also very interesting, titled Antiquity, Archaeological Process and Highland Adaptation, the Infilco Rice Terraces. And um, today I'm sure Professor Acobado is going to share more about uh, his latest research about indigenous archaeology. So let's join us to welcome Professor Acobado. Thank you, Lam, and thank you, CUHK community. Um, before I, I start, I want to acknowledge that I am a settler at the land of the Tongva, Gabrieliano Tongva peoples here in Los Angeles, and at the UCLA um, campus, uh, the UCLA community um, as a land grant institution um, um, also acknowledges that uh, we are uh, uh, living on the land of, of the traditional land gate caretakers of Tobangar or the uh, group that, that um, or Tuvangar, the land of, of the, the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern Channel Islands. Um, I would also like to mention that this, this talk, although my name is in it, um, this has uh, a lot of input from my collaborators in Ifugao and as well as my uh, 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 collaborator, uh, Martel, Marlon Martin. And as I mentioned, during our initial conversation earlier uh, with, with Sharon, uh, community archaeology is 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 very difficult for a lot of us, especially archaeologists, because we usually work in areas where uh, we stay in the field for three six months and then we leave, and sometimes we don't get return. But I have the privilege of working in a in a in the same region in the last. Well, 12 years, or actually 15 years now, including my dissertation research. So, um, so this this presentation, and thank you for for the invitation. It's an honor to to share our work, um, especially to um, highlight the collaborative and engaged um, component of of our archaeological research in the Philippines. And so, my presentation today talks about. Um, uh, this book that that is coming out um, next month, uh, published by the University of Arizona Press um, for the U.S. edition and Ateneo de Naga University Press uh, for the Philippine edition. And this book is motivated by um, our uh, interaction with two of the most prominent and respected uh, uh, local historians in Kiangan, um, the, the town that I've been working on in since uh, 2012. Um, and this, this anecdote, then this passage, we are descended from the pirate Limahong and the Chinese mercenaries who scampered up the Cordillera after getting trounced by the Spanish in the 16th century. This was the um, conversation starter that Uncle June, uh, who one died junior, um, and uh, Uncle Maning, uh, Manuel Dulawan, uh, another treasure de Fugao historian, um, uh, asked us during our uh, field school breaks or at, at our headquarters in 2012, um, they would come to our headquarters almost every day and, and engage us in, in conversations. Um, 
So they will ask us about detailed clarification, detailed questions about the role of the Chinese refugees in the construction of the rice terraces. Uncle June and Uncle Maning, who died, unfortunately died within a year of each other in 2013 and uh, 2014, wrote extensively on, on Ifugao culture and history. So as I mentioned, they participated in our daily field discussions in 2012 and attended our, our um, end of the field uh, presentations, both in 2012 and 2013, um, um, which encouraged us to seek their guidance on how to approach archeological work in a region that has long been used as an example of passivity and, and isolation. The re reference to Limahong is an example of how colonialism influenced dominant Philippine historical narratives, particularly on stressing that nothing significant was ever invented by indigenous groups, particularly in, in the Philippines. Although Limahong was a real person, uh, characterized as a Chinese pirate during the Ming Dynasty, who led raids against Spanish possessions in the Philippines, his group's escape to the mountains led to, the, to one of the myths that surround the origins of the Fogao rice terraces that the Chinese were to be credited for the construction of these agricultural marvels. And, and I've read um, textbooks in, uh, published in the 60s and the 70s that talks about this um, um, uh, reference. Uncle June and Uncle Maning were once tentative about our archaeological work, especially since we argue that the rice terraces are much younger than what is being taught in schools. As, and as a product of the Philippine educational system, I too learned in, in our history uh, discussions and, and also um, uh, the dominant narratives that the terraces were at least 2,000 years old. Um, but however, when, when we explain that the Chinese influence and the 2000 year old origin narratives are colonial in nature, they started to rethink what they learned in their lifetimes. And at their deathbeds, they told Marlon Martin, my, uh, the co-director of the Ifugao Archaeological Project and uh, the, and Ifugao, who, who is our collaborator, primary collaborator in the region, um, uh, they told him that to continue archaeological work so that the Fugawa would learn about their history through their own narratives and not through what has been preached by outsider perspectives. And as an outsider, um, I'm, I'm Filipino, I'm, uh, I am well aware of my positionality and, and the power dynamics that I bring in um, when we uh, talk about um, archaeological interpretation. And just a brief background on, on, on the Philippine, on Philippine history from 1521 up until uh, today, um, and especially with, with when the United States took over from Spain in 1898. Um, we all know that Magellan uh, came to the Philippines in 1521, and we are actually, or the Philippines, um, I think it's still uh, uh, within the year of the 500th year of the circumnavigation of Magellan's fleet and also uh, the introduction of Christianity in the Philippines. Um, so Ferdinand, Ferdinand Magellan uh, dropped anchor along the coast of the central Philippines in 1521. Um, his ex expedition was spurred by the objective of discovering a Western route to the Spice Islands, which is located south of the Philippine archipelago. Uh, Magellan has, had been in, in Southeast Asia. He, he was in, in Maluku, uh, uh, Malacca Straits, uh, even before coming to the Philippines. Um, although Magellan planted the, the Spanish flag in the Philippines in 15, 1521 and also died in the Philippines, uh, killed by um, a group uh, led by uh, Lapu-Lapu. It was not until 1565 that Miguel Lopez de Legazpi formally established a colonial government in present-day Cebu City. The establishment of the Spanish colonial government in the Philippines was a consequence of the discovery of a safe route between the Philippines and Mexico, the so-called Torno Viaje, which facilitated the famous Manila-Acapulco galleon trade. No one wanted to be in the Philippines, but because of, of the opportunity to trade with, with China, 
trade with Japan, trade with uh, uh, Southeast Asian groups. Um, uh, they decided to take control of the Philippines. And the Philippines was a was an afterthought in the conquest of the East Indies because the uh, the archipelago was thought to be an expensive possession. Again, the islands, yet the islands offered a potential springboard to trade with and to colonize China. And we know that they failed. Um, they also attempted to colonize um, uh, Cambodia, and also they failed. Um, in 1571, uh, Legaspi moved the administrative capital from Cebu to Manila, an area with one of the best harbors in the archipelago. To take advantage of Manila's location and facilitating trade with other Asian cities. And within six months after his capture of Manila, his grandson, Juan de Salcedo, led an expedition to explore the west coastal region of northern Luzon in search of the famed Igorot gold. The northern Philippines, including Ifugao, was directly affected by the galleon trade as agricultural products in the Cagayan Valley and, and, and generally the Northern Philippines were the main exports of the Philippines. The Spanish colonial administration constructed infrastructure and roads cutting through traditional territory of the Ifugao. Most present day cities and towns adjacent to Ifugao started as garrison towns meant to secure the supply route between Northern Cagayan Valley and Manila. This provided a Fugao an opportunity to access the colonial economic system. The Spanish colonial policies affected the everyday life of the Fugao. Um, and, and, and reduction, the uh, forced resettlement um, um, that was institution instituted by the Spanish um, also forced indigenous groups to settle in lowland towns that facilitated colonial control. This would have triggered resistance by direct military opposition or by moving away. So the, my, my discussion today is about the latter, which was a conscious decision to regroup and consolidate the political and economic resources that allowed the Fugao to successfully fend off the Spanish conquest. And the long Spanish or colonial, Spanish colonial experience in, in the Philippines has led to the interpretations of the past that glorify the colonialist history and their ability to subjugate populations. This is an example of colonialist archaeology whose sole intention is to discredit the capacity of indigenous populations to adjust inventively to colonial um, experience. This is exemplified by how history is taught in the Philippines, um, especially with uh, when the, the, the United States took over and when the Philippines was the centerpiece of the 1904 St. Louis uh, World Fair, which brought the Philippines to the consciousness and imagination of the American public. Um, it was a chance for the United States to showcase their new colonial possession. In this event, um, about 1,102 or 1,100 uh, Filipinos were presented as a justification for the U.S. occupation of the Philippines, because as they put it, and I quote, um, our mission is to represent the many stages of social progress from the lowest of barbarous headhunting savages to the best products of Christian civilization and culture. We would demonstrate the need for a common language and the value of American education to efface tribal antagonism and to prepare our little brown brothers to eventual self-governance and, and I uh, end quote. Uh, the fair showed how the strategy of benevolent assimilation would help uncolonized Filipinos reach civilization. Displayed in the fair were multiple ethnic groups from the Philippines, supposedly representing varying degrees of cultural sophistication. The human zoo, as we call it, juxtaposed Christianized Filipinos with those from groups who actively resisted conquest. This event justified the Amer American occupation of the Philippines as a means to, again, to help our little brown brothers govern themselves. This idea that there is a need to assimilate the 175 or so ethnicities in the Philippines to become Filipino continues today. 
It was at this point that anthropology was used to devise a program to assimilate Filipinos into a, into a new state modeled by the American culture. It was at this point that the, anthropo that, that the anthropology uh, program and, and anthropological uh, tools were used um, to, to uh, understand uh, the, the not unchristianized, non-Christianized, and un unconquered Filipinos. And this was also the time that H. Uh, Otley Bayer, um, the, the founder of father of Philippine anthropology, became interested in, in, in the Philippines and he applied and he got the job. Um, there are actually uh, uh, references to the fact that uh, Franz Boas applied for a job. Uh, for this job that H. Adley Bayer got. Um, and fortunately for me, he, he didn't get it. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be able to talk about Ifugao today as the way I, I, I uh, do my work, my investigations, my research in, in the region. Uh, H. Adley Bayer eventually became the US anthropologist in the country. And as I mentioned, became the founder of the Philipp of Philippine anthropology. Bayer articulated the Spanish era model of waves of migration into archeological model of the time, which was also tied to the 2000 year old history of the Fugao rice terraces that he argued that the terraces were at least 2000 years old. Um, this model that explains the peopling of the Philippines racializes cultural distinctions with the newer populations associated with superior technology. The 1904 St. Louis World Fair was a turning point in, in the US public's um, support of, of, of the occupation of the Philippines because uh, a significant number uh, population in the US during this time was uh, against US imperialism because the sentiment back then was that the US was a country that was born out of, of anti-imperialist uh, movement is was now becoming a, uh, uh, an imperialist itself. But because they crafted and framed their colonialism differently from Europeans, whereas Europeans would stay in, in their colonies, uh, in their possessions forever, um, the United States framed it in terms of benevolent assimilation or white man's burden where uh, once they educated and, and, and brought the savages, so-called savages into civilization and they're able to govern themselves, then they leave. So that was a turning point in, in the way the US, general US uh, public um, uh, 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 understood uh, US expansionism goals of, of, of imperialism in, in the early 20th century. Um, and and it, this, this, this shift and, and the arrival of, of, of H. Atli Bayer and other early American anthropo pioneering anthropologists in, in the country um, uh, meant that they were the ones to develop the models that explained the peopling of the Philippines, for example, with the waves of migration theory. And this 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 uh, model postulates that um, you have three three groups of people with varying um, skin color, skin tones, and each each group each wave with 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 becoming uh, fair and fairer skin uh, with associated uh, uh, higher technological sophistication. So it's intrinsically racist. Uh, unfortunately, that's still being taught in, in, in uh, Philippine uh, history curricula, at least in 2015 with, with a textbook that we've, we've, we've seen. Uh, uh, conversations with um, history teachers in the Philippines also suggest that this is still being taught in, in the country. Um, although historians in the 1970s have already pointed out the, the flawed foundation of this model. Um, and, and the long colonial experience of, of the Philippines, including especially the Spanish occupation of the Philippines, obscured indigenous and indigeneity in the country because they were trying to assimilate 
everyone into being Christianized. So that the reference was either be Christianized or unchristianized, infiels or, or Christianos. Um, but it was a different story during the American colonization. And as I mentioned, this was in display at the 1904 St. Louis World Exposition, where the juxtaposition of non-Christianized groups, the, especially the Igorot, with the Lowland Constabulary Band was used as justification for American colonization of the Philippines through the view that non-Western peoples need, need to be civilized. So they, they brought Filipino members, uh, Filipinos, Lowland Christianized Filipinos who were members of, of the Philippine Constabulary Band playing with Western instruments and juxtaposed them with the Igorot um, who were uh, conducting dog feast every other day uh, conducting this this so-called ritual savage rituals that that um, that suggested that they that the United States was needed to to educate um, this these groups into becoming uh, civilized. So the St. Louis World Exposition catalyzed American influence in Philippine scholarship, particularly the development of history curricula and archaeological research. The event helped facilitate the recognition of the Philippines in the American consciousness. It also improved public support in the continued occupation of the country. And as part of the benevolent assimilation policy, the 1904 St. Louis World Fair um, and set the so-called savages next to lowland, um, Christianized lowlanders, thus um, highlighting the difference between um, arbitrary and historical difference between those who were on the fringes on, of colonialism and those who were directly um, administered by the Spanish. Um, and there's also an absence of, of written history among indigenous groups in the Philippines, um, but it does not mean that the Fugao do not have history. So in my works starting at about three years ago, I avoid using the term prehistory since it is disparaging to indigenous peoples who have history but lacks the means to write about them. So in, in an indigenous archaeology context, um, a lot of us don't use the term uh, prehistory. Uh, in, in my work, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that we use uh, the term deep history. Um, but of course, in other contexts, uh, prehistory still works. Um, so we, we focus on the landscape um, because landscapes are replete with history um, and it has the ability to record human relationships also because it is socially and culturally constructed. So utilizing oral traditions and incorporating the centrality of rice in Ifugao um, in, in archaeological interpretations strengthens Ifugao historiography. The rice terraces are spaces that represent Ifugao social relations which define and create social and spatial context. In this sense, place is both personal and political, where placemaking is a product of social practices of constructing place and inscribing memories, which do not necessarily require particular skills or, or special sens sensibilities. And uh, so I mentioned uh, I started working in Ifugao in 2003 as part of my MA a thesis, and then I uh, returned in 2007 for my dissertation work. Um, and it's it's very difficult to work in in Ifugao because uh, uh, or it was challenging, not very difficult because no one has done archaeological work in the region since the 1960s. Um, uh, uh, for 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 logistic, logistical reasons, and also they they thought that the two thousand year old model and, and other archaeological research conducted so far uh, was already um, uh, sufficient, and so it was also difficult because um, this was the last stand of the Japanese. So every time we excavate, people think that we're looking for um, the famed you know, mythical Japanese loot. Uh, and so speaking of antiquity debates, um, there are two main contentions, the 2000 to 3000 year old model proposed by Barton and Bayer. Actually, this is more Barton, but we, we, we uh, 
usually credit Bayer because Bayer supposedly became uh, an active an archaeologist by, by training. Um, but Barton was the first one who argued that the terraces would have been constructed at least 2,000 years ago, and that's in 1919. It wasn't until 1955 that Bayer um, suggested that the same uh, uh, argument. And they just couldn't believe that the, the Ifugao were able would were able to construct um, this this uh, kilometers thousands of kilometers um, uh, terraces um, that fill valley after valley of, of Ifugao within a short amount of time. Um, but there's also a lot a number of, of historians, ethnic historians, and anthropologists who suggested that the terraces could have been much earlier than or much later. Than, than what Barton and Bayer proposed. Uh, for one, there was a complete absence of any references to rice and rice terraces um, until 1801. Of course, the, the absence of, of evidence is not evidence of absence, um, but the terraces are something to ho write home about, but there's really no references to rice terraces or wet rice produced there. Um, until again, I think, I think until 1801. Uh, Lambrecht also looked at um, Hood Hood, uh, the, the, the romantic tales, and, and he realized that um, a lot of the references refer to something that happened in the lowland and not on, on the highlands. Uh, Maher, Robert Maher, the last archaeologist who worked in the region in the 60s, um, also found um, archaeological uh, uh, radiocarbon dates that do not suggest that the terraces are at least 2,000 years old. Um, so, so let's see. So um, our work in the region um, uh, includes archaeology, spatial and energetics uh, data sets, ethnography, and, and, and community stories. Um, our work since 2012 focused on the old Kiangan village here. Um, this is the present day old uh, present day Kiangan. Uh, this was the the village that was uh, mentioned in an 1801 uh, letter by um, uh, a Spanish priest who went up to Ifugao, and he counted about 180 houses, so about 4,000 people, with about uh, 2,000 more. Um, um, people around uh, two uh, or three um, satellite or neighboring villages. Um, and, and following our, our landscape approach, uh, our, our, our work focuses on, on the archaeology of colonial encounters and ensuing entanglements between the indigenous peoples of the Philippines and incoming col Spanish colonists. Um, our book uh, and our work uh, expands the work of Eric Wolf, who, whose 1997 um, um, work shifted archaeologist ideas about the relationship between the colonized peoples and Europeans. In using De Fugao as a case study, we want to redirect focus to accommodation. We argue that De Fugao made decisions that uh, were beneficial to them, including strategies where they took part in the colonial enterprise. Basically, I'm arguing, and we're arguing that uh, there's no such thing as uncol uncolonized. Using the term and referring to the Fugao as uncolonized um, is racist and ethnocentric, is in, in its in its uh, use because it 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 argues um, that the Fugao and this, the peoples who are uncolonized are unchanging, and that's not what we see in the archaeological record. Uh, what we see in the archaeological record is that the rice, when's rice um, started being the primary crop in at around 1850, it was the time that the Fugao consolidated their economic and political resources through wet rice agriculture, which enabled them to endure more than 100 years of Spanish raids. The Spanish attempted to attack and, and conquer the old Kangan village, for example, 12 times. And, and they were repelled uh, 11 out of the 12. Um, I think the 
uh, eight, they were able to sack and 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 burn the village, but they they returned because the Spanish couldn't um, stay uh, uh, in in the region. Um, so we contend that they forgo environmental practice during the initial periods of Spanish conquest of northern Luzon counters the arguments that people moved to marginal places that were not valued by the colonizers and shifted to less productive agricultural practices to avoid colonial attention, places that are described as pericolonial. In contrast to upland agriculture and other areas of Southeast Asia, where highland groups tend to practice Swedening, the Fugao shifted to intensive wet rice cultivation soon after contact with the Spanish, even though wet rice was valued and taxed by the colonial administration. The shift to wet rice production became the organizing force that allowed the Fugao to successfully resist subjugation as irrigated rice production entails a more complex form of sociopolitical organization. Wet rice production entailed interacting with lowland groups to access imported goods like stone and, and glass beads and trade wear ceramics associated with the cultural context of rice production. So they weren't really um, isolated as, as uh, dominant narratives, of, in, in, historical narratives in the Philippines suggest. And to show that I'm really an archaeologist, here is a uh, 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 composite profile of our excavations in the old Cayman village. And, and we also excavated at five other sites. And, 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 and uh, the data actually all, all point to the introduction of rice much later than previously thought. And we know that they were uh, uh, cultivating and, and eating Taro. Taro was the main staple, carbohydrate staple, before um, the, the appearance of rice at about uh, 1600s. So we have spatial, paleoethnobotany, and then community stories that, that support this, this argument. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the dominant theme shaping the his, history text, history books of the Fugao contend that the rice terraces in the region are at least 2,000 years old. These agricultural mo monuments are the foundation of Ifugao culture. Recent work, however, suggests that the construction of these monuments took place after Spanish contact, representing a response to colonialism. Our archaeological and ethnographic research from 2007 to 2017 has helped to reshape these understandings of history. The emergence of wet rice cultivation coincided with the arrival of Spanish in the northern Philippines and demonstrates an active Ifugao social or organization equipped to counter attempts at conquest. More importantly, archaeological evidence strongly suggests that the Ifugao accepted the economic pressures exerted by the colonial administration and were successful at resisting Spanish conquest by becoming part of the colonial economic system. So in our work, we demonstrate that the Defugao shift of subsistence base from wet taro to wet rice ushered in needed political consolidation that allowed them to participate in the colonial economic world. We highlight accommodation as a form of resistance and, a, and an expression of active effort for cultural persistence. This perspective is based on a decade of archeological and ethnographic work in, in Ifugao which indicate an active participation of the Fugao in the colonial economic system. And this is also something that I used in my, my, my uh, this dissertation, uh, my first book that looked at um, James Scott's Zoomia model for um, mainland Southeast Asian highland groups went up to the mountains and practiced Swedening as an escape agriculture because um, um, uh, rice, wet rice is being valued by rice kingdoms in, uh, along the coast. And in the Philippines, as described by dominant Philippine historiography, the Cordillera resistance narrative has reached the level of myth and became the basis of Cordilleran and, and Ifugao identity. Given, however, uh, given uh, an archaeologist argues that Resistance is multifaceted and complex, more a range of decisions and negotiations than a single activity. So we offer now these opposing narratives using this perspective on resistance. 
although the Spanish had a hard time establishing a presence or a foothold in the highlands, it was just because they forgot the resisting quest were exploiting the colonial economic opportunities to strengthen their social political organization, co-opting the new economic system which allowed them to repel Spanish attempts at conquest. And what is clear um, from the findings at the, the old Kiangan village site is that the introduction of wet rice varieties and in the suite of crops cultivated in the upland region coincided with the initial presence of the Spanish in the adjacent lowland. And this shift to wet rice was accompanied by a rapid increase in trade wear and util utilitarian ceramics. Um, and it appears that economic intensification occurred simultaneously soon after the Spanish arrival in the Northern Philippines. These changes would have been associated with settlement expansion and political changes. And I mentioned that in, in 1801, they counted about 4,000 people in the old Gangan village. Compare that to Manila, the present day uh, place where Intramuros, the walled city is constructed, there were only 2,000 people there. And then they the Spanish were already in the region, in, in the Fugao region as early as the mid 1700s. Um, so population wise, uh, they, were, they were larger. And so wet rice cultivation would have fed more population compared to taro, which was documented to be the main crop before the adoption of wet rice. <clears throat> wet rice would also have allowed Ifugao to intensify trading with lowland groups since rice is a major trading item before and during conquest. More importantly, rice produced in the, in the irrigated terrace fields of Ifugao provided the necessary supply for ritual feasting. Among the Ifugao, rituals and feasts bond the community observed even today. And the timing of, of um, agricultural and trade intensification occurred simultaneously um, and, and was accompanied by evidence of elaboration of social differentiation through feasts and rituals. The recovered water buffalo remains, or carabao, attest to the rise of the elite in Ifugao. Uh, water buffaloes are associated with the elevation of elites into higher status of Kadangyan and, and uh, uh, commoners are not allowed to, to butcher a, a carabao. There is a total absence of water buffalo remains before um, 1650 CE. And so I, in other work, I use the term pericolonial archaeology, uh, which highlights the capacity of indigenous populations to adjust to colonial pressures. Far from the lowlander stereotype of Ifugao as warriors who will fight to death, to the death. What is observed in the Philippine highlands is a conscious effort to deal with colonialism in more complex and sophisticated ways, a strategy that has been reflected in other pericolonial regions in the Philippines. Such studies links history, identity, and heritage. So our work serves as a counterpoint to national historical narratives. Indigenous voices have been erased by colonial structures which are maintained by the current state of affairs in the Philippines. We trace the history of archeology span and heritage management in the country to set up what we think is the best way to make archeology span and history meaningful, especially to descendant communities. And as, a, as an example, um, we've collaborated and, and work with um, Ifugao elders to, to interpret the archeological record. And so we've had multiple um, uh, uh, consultation meetings, informal meetings, uh, drinking sessions, and uh, just to, to, to get their ideas about um, uh, our interpretations of the archeological record. So we went back to this idea of the Hu'ua, a, a uh, Ifugao um, uh, origin myths, and so if we go myths and, and legends, and so we, we incorporated a lot of, of um, uh, passages into our, and in, in, in the book that's coming out next month, and uh, 
some of the, or actually a lot of, of, of oral history tend to support what we've, we've been um, arguing based on, on the archeological record. There is a, uh, uh, one of the best examples of, of, of these, a, a product of this uh, work with, with consultation with, with, with the um, elders is this old and 2000 year old model. Uh, when Marlon pointed out to the Ifugao and showed them the elders old photos of their uh, ancestors, like 1800, 1900 photos. And they said, oh, that's my grandmother. That's my great, great grandmother. And Marlon said, this is old, right? And he said, yeah, that, those photos are old. And, and he said, you know, the terraces are old too, but we don't count old. We don't look at old in years. So for us, the terraces are old. Um, uh, in the first place, those are the, the archaeologists and the historians and anthropologists were the ones who said that the terraces are 2,000 years old. Not us, not Ifugao. For us, it's old. It's our our great grandmother uh, is old, so um, we should look at it differently. And so we integrate um, local history, oral history, in in. Um, our interpretation of, of the archaeological record. Of course, it's a continuing uh, discussion, a continuing dialogue, because I am, I am uh, for the most part, trained in the Western um, uh, ideology of, of archaeology. Um, but working with Ifuga, working with, with, with um, uh, descendant communities, provide us a, a way to make archaeology more meaningful. We can't change the, the way we do archaeology um, um, with, with the careful excavations. Um, and an indigenous archaeology doesn't necessarily mean that, and even community archaeology uh, do not necessarily mean that, uh, that is descendant communities are going to excavate. Uh, they could be part of the developing research questions. They could be part of uh, the, the interpretation of the archeological record or the dissemination of, of the findings or the, the translation of the findings into something that the community can, can, can use. And, and in Ifugao, we've been able to do that with the establishment of the Ifugao Community Heritage Galleries that now serve as the Indigenous Peoples Education Center in the region. Um, and, and that's one of the successful stories of community archaeology in, in the world today, in the world of archaeology today. So a shorter history of the terraces does not diminish their value in being recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Rather, it reinforces the awareness of the technological and cultural sophistication of the people who constructed the terraces. This sophistication allowed Ifugao to rapidly modify their landscape to fill valley after valley with terraced rice fields within 200 years. Uh, the the Batai rice terraces could have been constructed within 25 years. Um, we should lay to rest the antiquity debates. They only exoticize highland peoples. Moreover, the differences that we see today between highland inhabitants and lowland populations are products of history and colonialism. It is more important for us that we acknowledge that we are in danger of losing these historical and cultural monuments and that we have a responsibility to take part in preserving our heritage. Most importantly, we have to acknowledge the value of community involvement in our scholarly research and conservation and development programs in the region. We emphasize the importance of community engagement, especially since historical knowledge in the Philippines is still largely a colonial legacy. We propose that community involvement is vital in the dissemination of new knowledge. In our work, this is highlighted by community skepticism of the younger dating of the rice terraces, especially when all tourism brochures and history textbooks celebrate the old antiquity of the, the agricultural fields. We also explore the colonial legacies of knowledge construction and how this knowledge becomes ingrained into people's ideas of the past 
In the case of the Philippines, archaeological models proposed at the, the turn of the 20th century by American archaeologists and anthropologists have been difficult to demystify. So in this work, we represent the impact of archaeological work in Ifugao, which has contributed to a serious reconsideration of the dominant conceptions of history and history making in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for uh, a wonderful and very uh, fascinating talk. And I'm sure um, a lot of audience uh, have questions uh, regarding the details of the of the case study and the rice agriculture. And uh, may I take the um, uh, opportunity to raise the first question, um, uh, which is related to the uh, rice agriculture and the transition to uh, the rice agriculture. Um, so uh, maybe you have already uh, mentioned that in the talk, or maybe I uh, missed some part. But I, I was I'm I'm curious, what is the underlying motivation for the shift of uh, wet uh, rice agriculture? And as you said, uh, wet rice agriculture involves um, labor organization on a uh, larger scales, and uh, it. Uh, of course, could involve uh, more sophisticated social management and social control, right? So uh, I'm curious, um, what is the major underlying factor for the transition? Is um, a strategy to um, organize more people, right? To uh, join a bigger allies for the uh, Spanish army, or uh, is there any like real economic value of rice so that people were willing to grow more rice uh, to get like some other stuffs? Thank you, Lam. Uh, there are a lot of there are several answers to that question, but um, if you if I'm going to choose one, it's alcohol, rice wine. Um, because rice wine is needed for rituals and feast. Um, and, and the transition was rapid. Uh, uh, the, the replacement for a taro production was drastic. And, and there was no continued. Once we see the, the shift to wet rice, all of the charred residue that we've looked at are mostly rice uh, we, we 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 stopped it it might be a matter of of, of sampling um, but before the emergence of rice all of this the the charred residue and and isotopes although they're mostly the same um, but isotopes from from faunal uh, so faunal management suggested that there was a shift from c4 to c3 mm -hmm. uh, but anyway uh, peoples from the lowlands who presumably were Ifugao, because when the Spanish initially came to the Magat Valley and, and that, that region around, uh, just on the lowlands, that valley region, they counted about 149 villages. This is in, in um, the 1590s. When they returned 50 years later, only 49 villages remained. Uh, so either those villages died off um, because of diseases, but we don't think that um, populations back then were were uh, were susceptible to to Eurasian um, pathogens because they they were already um, exposed to to most of the pathogens that that were in, in Eurasia because of of contacts with South Asian uh, Chinese traders, uh, mainland Southeast Asian traders, and so they could have moved up as, as a form of active resistance against Spanish taxation um, and, and being forced to live in, in a, the colonial, the towns, the reduction, the, the resettlement process. So to answer your question, uh, they went up and, and, and they got integrated into the taro producing groups in, in the highlands, which presumably were all Ifugao because we see the same type of, of artifacts from a thousand years to 1650, especially the type of, of, of beads that they were adorning the infants in, 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 in their burials. But to answer your question of what was the motivation, it would be the, the rituals. Um, 
and and because rice is not produced for economic reasons mostly it's for prestige um, uh, uh, the term kadangyan is associated with a bit the kadangyan is the uh, the elite so there are three uh, statuses the, the kadangyan um, the tagu and the nawutput um, the, the kadangyan are the rice land holders uh, they're wealthy they they have um, expensive beads trade or ceramics the tagu are usually relatives of the kadangyan they also own rice land rice lands um, but they don't have the capacity to um, sponsor feasts and rituals because if you're going up in the ladder uh, in, in in this uh, different statuses require um rituals and feasts that you have to feed the whole community and uh, the neighboring communities uh, uh, butchering a very expensive um, water buffalo which you will have to procure from the lowlands um, and so on and, and then what what are uh, root crop eaters literally that's what the term what would mean root crop eater and so rice could have been used for for minimal uh, trading with with lowlands, but rice was mainly kept for uh, rituals, like a sort of conspicuous consumption. Um, um, that during rituals they would cook a lot of, of rice to feed the whole the whole group. I mean the whole community and neighboring communities, and also to to produce rice wine. So uh, with religious studies um, uh, rituals tend to uh, consolidate um, community cohesion. Um, and that would have been one of the impetus for, for their successful um, resistance against conquest. Oh, thank you, thank you. And I'm sure my colleagues and our students, uh, they uh, have uh, a lot of questions regarding this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, Sharon, uh, you raise your hand, right? Yes, um, thank you, Stephen. Very interesting talk. Yeah, basically, I'm, yeah, I, I know you build up a lot of work on your, including website and uh, if you go archaeology. Um, I have two questions. First, um, I, I really want to learn from you how to conduct a community archaeology, including the related the topic on decolonization uh, on Southeast Asian archaeology. Um, because I realized that right now you are working out of the region, but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you are working on community archaeology in Ivugo. So uh, how can you balance your time and how can you, uh, you know, publish something that is, you know, mainly faced to um, the Western scholars or the international scholars, because uh, I find that uh, your major publication actually was published in the Philippines. And maybe some of them maybe in Tagalog or maybe in Ifugo language, language, because when I work in Cambodia, I also have a problem on how can we balance how many publication we publish in, uh, in English rather than the local language like um, Khmer or even in, in Chinese. So how can you balance that? Because basically your scholarship uh, was uh, start from um, the UP and then you went to um, Hawaii and then went out in UCLA. So I really want to know how can, uh, how can you deal with as a anthropological archeologist, how, uh, when you write something related to the Ifugo indigenous people, how can you balance that? Because, uh, or it based on your uh, publication in different languages. So this is my first question. And second question is, um, I'm really curious because uh, as you know that Ifugo or even Kolenga, also in the area in the Lovendu Lu zone. So uh, I, I just wonder, uh, because you um, suddenly mentioned about whether you may use some like if no archeology. Yeah, I, yeah, I, sorry, I mentioned about Miriam, <laughs> uh, but, how how can um how can did you do anything related to if if no archaeology or experimental archaeology when you work on um the work in uh if you go I really want to know did they have any like um um uh, cultural exchange or economic linkage with each other uh, in particular in the northern Luzon area uh, and then finally I as I know that uh Robert Fox he did have some uh archival pictures 
related to the Ivugo burial uh, ritual. So I really learn, hope to learn from you. How do you think about um, this archive? Thank you. Sharon, the, both really difficult questions. <laughs> the first one, especially with, with the, we have standards. Uh, as before getting tenure, I am, I was told to, or suggested was the term to publish in top 10 archaeological journals, uh, anthropological journals, um, that I have to publish two or at least three articles, journal articles per, per year. Uh, uh, and then uh, again, those three, we should be on the top 10 um, archaeology journals. Um, so my, my first, I think three or four years at UCLA, that's what I did. Um, but then I started thinking about uh, publication, publishing in, in these top tier journals with paywalls um, that that is anathema to, to us being engaged scholars um, when we publish and then the communities that we work with um, do not have access to, to our, our publications. And so I'm also lucky that UCLA is shifting to, to or actually is, is recognizing the work of, of community engaged scholars, that there is a, a recognition of, of the quality of publication, even though they're not published in uh, know, the top ten, um, and and in that case, in that sense, I you know I'm lucky to be in, at UCLA and also with very very um, supportive colleagues that they would actually support that uh, once I started publishing in in open access venues. Um, on on community and Philippine venues, um, they would add uh, uh, support for that during faculty discussions, during letters that they would write for to support our our uh, uh, our personal cases. And so, uh, community archaeology is is there's no one size fits all. Um, uh, it's hard. Uh, because we have to relinquish some form of control, especially for archaeologists, um, that we what we do, especially in the excavation, the recording, um, it's something that uh, we're trained to, and, and communities are are well, they can, um, but in my in again in my case in Ifugao, they they we we invited the community and our collaborators to. To train to dig with us, and after two hours, they said this is too hot and too too dirty for us, so they, they stop. And so um, the community archaeology aspect there is they they we we do um, develop co-develop the the research questions, and then uh, knowledge co-production and co-creation later. Um, and then the publication. Going back to your question about how do I balance that, um, so I. What I do is to make sure that I address the requirement to publish in, in top tier journal. And I did publish a lot on, on open access. So I'm, I'm actually, I just finished my, my personal case. Uh, uh, as archaeologists too, we are uh, uh, writing a book is not, that big of a deal deal in our cases um, because we have to publish again on, on journals. But that's all, again changing because books would have a longer shelf life than than a journal article. A journal article after a year, that's that's already history. But if you write a book, then that that would be widely dis distributed. Um, and so I think what I did in my I'm on my ninth year in, in at UCLA. I published about 40, 40 journal articles and, and three books. Um, I have another book coming out after this. Part. Anyway, it's a I, I've been writing a lot during the pandemic. If there's an, a, a silver lining for this stay at home, I, I wrote three books during the pandemic. Uh, and I have a very supportive family. It's part of that. <laughs> Part of that uh, answer to your question is that I have two kids and, and, and a very supportive wife. Um, 
what else? Uh, community archaeology too. I started forcing myself to write um, for the public. Uh, uh, I've written about 15 uh, op-ed pieces, uh, which actually helped me write the book uh, because the I shifted my tone from a very scientific or sciencey uh, writing to a more accessible form of writing. Um, and I was reading the, the changes of, of my uh, op-ed articles. The first two or three were really boring for, for, the, for most readers. Um, and then I get comments from, from journalist friends. It's like, oh, you don't have to do that, you do this. So um, it helped. And I think it's also part of, of our work as community engaged scholars to help to to have our work accessible, not just access, but but the way we write, we write should be uh, understandable to to the people, uh, the wider public. And in terms of the second question, um, there's really not a lot of of, of, of analysis that looks at um, intra. Uh, Cordilleran um, uh, in, uh, interaction. Well, we do know that they were accessing the same um, uh, prestige goods from the lowlands. Like they have the same access to those trade war ceramics. Um, and, and it has something to do with, with wine, rice wine making again. Uh, we know that they were producing rice wine on earthenware ceramics before the introduction of, of dragon jars. But you know that earthenware ceramics are porous and they don't last long. But with, with earthenware or, or, or trade war ceramics, especially with, with the dragon jars um, and, um, uh, and then Ming jars later, uh, rice wine would have lasted longer. Uh, uh, they can store them longer, um, and then that those those trade war ceramics became heirloom items. That the longer they are in the family's possession, they become more uh, more expensive. They can use them to buy uh, rice fields, um, and they have histories. Uh, each each heirloom piece has a history of its own like a, the social life of things. Um, but again, going back to your question, if I did ethnoarchaeology, I've, I've done a lot of ethno ethnography, but my analysis mostly is more um, uh, oral history, uh, landscape, uh, GIS, uh, and nothing much on, on uh, inter-Cordilleran group. Um, in terms, there, there's really no archaeology done in in Kalinga, <laughs> literally zero. Uh, I mean, ethnoarchaeology, yes, but not the excavations. There's one in Bontok with Cod, uh, uh, Connie Bodner, um, and then uh, Mix Canilao started work in in uh, the other side of, of, of the mountain range, uh, the Benguet Ibaloy area. Um, but our, our goal is to do a pine cordilleran archaeological project, um, which would be a big task. Um, and, and, and actually my goal is to, to, to provide opportunities for uh, cordillerans to pursue PhD in, 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 in training in archaeology so that they'll be the ones doing the their work of, in the region rather than uh, relying on on us outsiders, but by the way, I did try to apply for a job in the Philippines, but uh, Eileen knows the story. <laughs> Thank you. I know the know the story. Yeah, and uh, Robert Fox, do you know that uh, the archive on the Evigo? Yeah. So, did do you use uh, his material on the interpretation about the Evigo indigenous okay. people's history? Um, yeah, I think actually there's a, so Robert Fox did most of that work in Banawe. Um, and that's, a, they have a very different, so each, 
So Ifugao, and I forgot to mention that in the, the introduction, Ifugao is is um, is very diverse. At least four, uh, five uh, groups with with differing uh, identities. Like they have different uh, variants of Ifugao, but the religion is the same. Um, so we use some of, of Robert Fox's uh, analysis on burials, especially those ad adult burials. Um, but we don't really, it's hard to, to, we don't want, at least for me personally, to do, to excavate and to go into the crypt of, of, of the ancestors' remains because they believe in, in um, mana. Um, so uh, if if you if there's no so you have to to conduct a ritual to be able to bring out the bones if you if you touch the bones without the ritual the family the descendant family might um, might face uh, like misery misfortune etc so we we try to avoid um uh, burial crypts that are known to be part of, still known by by the communities. They don't care if they don't they don't have a a, a connection to the human remains. Um, uh, but we did uh, so to answer your question. Yes, um, just using their descriptions of, of burial so that we are able to look at. Let's say we found a an 800 year old uh, scapula um, with a, a, a slash mark. It was definitely a slash mark from, from head hunting 800 years ago. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have question from Li Xing and Yu Chen and Andy. Mm -hmm. Li Xing or Xing Li. Uh, okay. You raised your hand first, right? Yeah. Okay, is, is that me? Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm a PhD student here in this department. Um, my question is about how your argument is received in the local community. When I say local community, I think it includes both the indigenous people who you like in the community where you work, and also, I don't know, like broadly more about Philippine based archaeologists or public in general, because I think you're. Um, doing a great job in terms of challenging the mainstream narratives about colonialism. And I think you mentioned this very interesting example in the beginning, like we use these two local histories, like two uncles who are saying like, oh, Philippine history is all about colonialism and everything's from outside. So there seems to be this kind of, I'm trying to think of where, but this kind of sentiment against this, you know, colonialism creates everything, all the problems and, and everything's shaped by colonialism, but you're kind of saying something quite different in terms of, it's not just we are conquered, but we are kind of actively participating in this process to, for our own benefits. Um, so I, I feel like there might be some tension in between. And I think you also mentioned something in your talk about how you talk to local elderly. Um, and I think that's a fascinating part of the research in terms of how you incorporate you know, local histories, local stories in your research. So yeah, I think my question is broadly about this, how your argument are received by local people or I don't know, Philippine-based scholars, public in general, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, basically what you're asking me is decolonization really, can we really decolonize what we do? <laughs> uh, uh, um, so in terms of responses, initially they forgot, um, they were really, really ready to take my head off. Uh, no one took, um, uh my publication in 2007 as as something solid so before i right after i did i finished my dessert no no my my field work i published um, in in the top archaeology journal antiquity um and 
even the reviewers during that that for that um publication mentioned that is this garbage in and gospel out uh, <laughs> so as as a graduate student like, what is this? <laughs> i know someone that i know is probably a senior scholar uh uh, uh, uh uh, wrote that that comment um but and actually suggested that the journal reject my 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 paper but the other reviewer was more more uh, took has a really longer and more supportive um that to answer your question it's the initially mostly pessimism mostly um tempered response that this is a new research uh, and even when i returned back in 2012 um still i don't see any um even my colleagues in the university of the philippines historians actually a lot more historians are are resistant to that idea um but when i started working with with the community especially since that finding really impinges on, on the identity of the Ifugao, which is basically founded on the idea that they were uncolonized and that their terraces are at least 2,000 years old. It also doesn't help that UNESCO, the UNESCO nomination highlights the 2,000 year old um, dating. And so a lot of them were asking about models uh, or rather, uh, asking about the generalization. And I think it, it has something to do with our understanding of what archaeology is and the understanding of the, the general population of what archaeology is. So every time I give a talk, I say that archaeology is, is about testing hypothesis and not finding the truth. And I, whatever data that we have now, is is the truth and the truth will change tomorrow if there's another set of data sets another set of data so i i, I say that because um uh most of the questions that were asked and, and, and criticisms for my initial uh publications up until 2015 um they always ask so why are you making this generalization when you're you're radiocarbon dates were only, or your data sets are only from Banawe and, and Kiangan. Um, then I said, because that's, that's the hypothesis, that's the process, that's the, that's the research design. And so I, I used the same research design in Banawe, in Kiangan, in Batad, um, and five other uh, areas in the Philippines, which all uh, actually um, confirm our, our, our hypothesis. Uh, and so if we find something, and if somebody finds something that's older, that refutes our arguments, then I'm, I'm willing to, <laughs> that's, that's the nature of science. Uh, there's no permanence in, in science, right? Thank you. Uh, Ruchin? I, I think Andy raised hand first. Anyone, oh, would you, would okay. you like to go first, Andy? Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting uh, talk. I am a cultural anthropologist, so I know very little about archaeology. And um, also, even though I do research with uh, Filipinos in Hong Kong, I have limited uh, um, understanding of the Philippines, but I found the uh, pericolonialism idea super interesting, and your talk certainly gave me a new perspective uh, regarding all the very rich uh, literature of uh, uh, cultural anthropology, who anthropologists work who, who focus uh, in Luzon in the indigenous communities. And one of the things that uh, in that literature that remind me is. Um, related to uh, the, the work of the feminist anthropology and how, um, how, how uh, anthropo anthropology there has been literature that try to uh, argue against the, the androcentric uh, tradition, right? And then to look at things from a, 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 a women-centered 
perspective. So I, I see the similarity there, but in that literature, there's a very uh, clear political motivation for developing it. And so I'm, I'm just curious whether you also have a very clear uh, motivation in um, the uh, working on the ideas of um, pericolonialism. I, I would love to hear more. And the other thing is in the idea of pericolonialism, if I got it correctly, I think you were talking about this is uh, people and region or a community that's not completely uh, colonized, but they are affected politically and economically. So uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that interaction, how uh, this you know, not colonized community were affected uh, and whether there is like, you know, um, positive negative side of that perception. That, that impacts. Thank you. That, that, and thanks for asking that question because I forgot to mention that um, one of the motivation for me and, and my collaborator Marlon in, in, in continuing our, our, our partnership and community engagement is this idea of indigenous in the Philippines. Um, I just, my most recent, uh, maybe one of my op-eds talked about when the native is not indigenous, because in the Philippines, I am, I was born in the Philippines. My great grandfather was born in the Philippines. Although my DNA says I have 10% sub-Saharan African DNA. I don't know where that is, um, but anyway, so uh, part of the motivation and, and the ideology that, that or activism um, behind the concept of pericolonialism is to break that dichotomy between indigenous Filipinos and Christianized Filipinos. That, that even our statutes, even the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act of 1997 is still based on that waves of migration theory of, 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 of H. Otley Beyer, um, that being indigenous means that you are an unchanging culture. Um, being indigenous is, means that, that you have been resistant to outside influence. And, and I think, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a product of its time, 1997. Um, the Philippines was probably one of the first countries to institute an indigenous people's uh, rights um, um, statute. It, predated the, the United Nations Declaration of the Indigenous, of indigenous Peoples by, by a decade. Um, but uh, I use the term indigenous because I know that it's empowering, um, but I also know that there is a very uh, racist foundation. And, and as someone from the Philippines, and Eileen uh, uh, can probably add into this that, uh, as, as, as someone um, who, who was educated in the Philippines, there is a lot of racism by Filipinos against other Filipinos, even lowland Filipinos, uh, that we make fun of the way another person speaks, especially uh, when they speak Tagalog with, 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 a, with an accent. Um, and and Growing up in an area where some of, of the Agta would come in um, and I would hear adults in, in my community say, oh, the Agta are here. Um, and, and when you do something bad, they say, oh, you're like an Agta and you don't have government, you're like an Agta. So in a sense, my, my motivation here to, to write about pericolonialism and some of my work is to really demystify some of, and, and to help and learn, um, uh, provide these data sets for, for educators that they can use to develop educational materials to, to help us unlearn um, generations of, of, of flawed history. Andy. Um, yes, yeah, so I, in some ways, I think you answered my questions and they're sort of go with the first two questions, um, but maybe I'll just rephrase it a little and get a little more detail. So I, in the peri-colonial context, you, were, you had this idea, I think I remember something like colonialism uh, 
without colonization. I, I, I remember that phrase. And I took it as meaning something like social transformation in a peri-colonial context that occurs despite the fact that there's no direct colonization. So I guess my first question there was then, how would you distinguish this from just any model of diffusionist trade that had some new technology coming in leading to social transformations, um, uh, which I suppose happens all the time. And then the second question, what you really started to get at there, but uh, you know, again, it's sort of not related to what Xing Li was talking about. And, and, and so I was just wondering, how can you do this sort of decolonial uh, archaeology without reifying this idea of community. So there is the community you're working with, but it reifies both across time. So you don't know that who was, you know, if you have evidence from a thousand years ago, are those people really related to the people there today? And then of course it also reifies socially in the present where there might be considerable disputes in the community over anything and and then you've talked to certain people and their ideas become the ideas of the quote community that's thank my you. two questions yeah. thank you the, the first question thank you uh, uh, for, uh, actually i'm more uh the second question is probably is more interesting <laughs> uh, the the first question is more so it's more interpretation. Um, and also, again, based on my knowledge of, it's a response to historiography and history making in the Philippines that um, argues that the cultures, the indigenous peoples were isolated, that they were, that they are remnants of the past, that if you want to learn about pre-Hispanic Filipinos, you just go up in the mountains and voila, you have a, a human zoo or, or, or not a human zoo or a, a, a museum uh, that you can and look at and learn about um, you know, practices that predated uh, um, Christianity and that, that which is very racist. Uh, but um, we, we read that on textbooks, we read that on even, uh, especially now with, with a lot of online modules when, when there's very limited quality control. And so when I, when I talk about colonial, uh, very colonialism um, and, and, and call colonialism with that colonization, I'm, I'm referring to the fact that um, groups who are on the fringes of, of the colonized world uh, need to to adjust their culture, need to adjust their their worldview uh, to be able to survive um, uh, the pressures of the, the new world or, or the new status uh, status quo. So um, uh, when we look at the archaeological record, again, they they suggest the record suggests that the people, especially in the old Gangan village and in, in Banawe, um, were accessing goods from the lowlands. That they were um, uh, part of the economic system rather than being isolated. Yes, they weren't being they weren't conquered. So I, I, I don't use the term that they weren't colonized um, because in a sense, there's really, there's, there's no such thing as uncolonized in a colonized setting. Even if you're, I, even if you're say isolated, even when we say that the, the Muslim groups in the South were not, weren't um, colonized, um, but they were because they needed to, um, uh, rapidly and drastically change their behavior to respond to the pressures of, of, of European um, expansion in the Philippines during that time. The second question, um, in terms of community, that's been one of the contentious uh, <laughs> uh, discussion, whether um, 
the archaeologic the archaeology and the people that live in that region in in, in that village was it's even um ifugao um but because of the continuity of and and similarities of of the material record that we find, especially the beads, um, uh, and also the description of Spanish, um, the first description of the Spanish um, of, of that region, we think that um, they are they are Ifugao, and and when they abandoned that that village sometime after 1832, we don't know why. There were stories about uh, uh, water disease, and I think it might be cholera that that forced them to leave the the village. and And there are oral histories about where the families went after they left um, the old Gaman village, and so they can still say, "Oh, we're, we're related to them because." Uh, they are also from from the old Garen village, um, but that is uh, a continuing uh, discussion, especially now that we're expanding our work in 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 interior villages. Uh, most of the old villages, or all, all of the old villages, are in the interior. Um, villages started to move up when the Americans uh, constructed the roads. And so big villages will be closer to the roads now on top of the, the terraces when before um, interior villages will be, or villages would be on the bottom of the rice fields um, and in the interior of, of closer to, to the river. Okay, because of the um, uh, limitation of time, uh, even though we have a lot of uh, very good questions, may I ask Professor Acobado to take the, uh, like the question in the chat box as the last question. Uh, again, the question is quite big. Uh, it's asking, um, how do you start a career uh, in Philippine uh, anthropology, especially in a um, non Filipino university that does favor Western anthropology? Uh, well, it is quite big. Okay, but uh, I let you respond. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um there are well I'm in the United States I'm in the West Coast so it's it's different because there are uh, four million Filipinos in the US 1.5 million Filipinos in in California uh, almost 700,000 Filipinos in Los Angeles uh, so there is a big um, clamor to to and I went to Hawaii with with like thirty percent of the population is Filipino too, um, but you're right that the that it's Western epistemology, but there's also this need for representation. Um, uh, when I started teaching here at UCLA and and actually last uh, last quarter um, in in the fall. Um, one of my students started crying when he said, "I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I, I didn't imagine that I'll have a, I'll have a professor at UCLA who has the same accent as my mom." Um, so it was something that I always keep on, on thinking about it when when I, I work with heritage students. So um, there are uh, a lot. Most of so most of of. Uh, Philippine programs in 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 the U.S. Um, are part of ethnic studies, um, and 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 most of, of even cultural anthrop even anthropology, um, and a lot of, of my colleagues who, especially the new generation, I'm I'm probably a, an older generation now, um, but but there is a shift in in the theoretical uh the paradigm that they use and 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 a lot of of, of younger um uh, philippine specialists now in 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 the us are um using the more activist decolonizing approach and and to the point that they would um uh, they wouldn't cite uh uh particular ethnicities, <laughs> a particular gender, uh, 
in 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 their work because they want to highlight um, uh, the the structures that that reify uh, the colonized mind, the colonized uh, education system. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Acobado. Um, and uh, because of the uh, like the issue of time, we have to stop here. Uh, even though I, I think we uh, we still have some questions, right? Um, but uh, I think uh, you are very welcome to send uh, email to Professor Acobado if you have any questions that uh, we don't have enough time for you to raise. And may I ask everyone to join me to uh, thanks uh, Professor Acobado for giving us a wonderful presentation and uh, answering uh, various uh, good questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay safe.